This podcast tells the story of Susie Favor Hamilton. Susie's story has been all over the media this fall with the release of her bestseller, Fast Girl. From ABC's 2020 to Dr. Phil, her story is great for ratings and full of opportunities for interviewers to create a gotcha moment. Her story is that of the girl next door turned Olympian turned prostitute. The real story, though, is not about her days as a high-priced escort. The real story is about a woman who did all the right things until her mental illness sent her on another path, and that path became a nightmare. Here is her story. This is Jay Coulter, and you are listening to the Conquer Worry Podcast. Our mission is to motivate and inspire people who are struggling with their mental health. Each episode, we will bring you an inspirational story or an interview with someone who is making a difference in the lives of others. This episode is sponsored by Your Protocol, the new customizable mental resilience training program and app designed specifically for people who struggle with their mental health. Start rebuilding your mind by visiting yourprotocol.com. That's the letters U and R, protocol.com. Again, that's yourprotocol.com. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Conquer Worry Podcast. Today, we're going to discuss mental resilience and mental health with three-time Olympian and author Susie Favor Hamilton. Her story has been featured on ABC's 2020, Dr. Phil, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, and many others. On this podcast, we like to feature stories of redemption or interview people who are making a difference in the lives of others. And Susie's story does both. Susie, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me here. All right, so before we start, I need to thank our mutual friend, Andy Berman, for connecting us. You know, he's a fantastic mental health advocate, and he just feels that you and your story will really resonate with people who struggle with their mental health. And, you know, Andy is an amazing person, and we do share very similar stories, um, which it's, it's nice to have somebody that I can relate to. Um, who understands exactly what I went through. And it's good to have a friend that you know is always there for you. Yeah, and his passion always comes through. Yes. So before we start, let me give our listeners a short overview of your success as an athlete. So get comfortable. This takes a little while. Susie was very successful. (laughs) So at the University of Wisconsin, she won nine NCAA championships. She won a silver medal at the 1998 World University Games. She is the most decorated female athlete in NCAA track and field history. She won four USA Outdoor Track and Field Championships. She won three USA Indoor Track and Field Championships. And she competed for the United States in the Summer Olympics in 1992, 1996, and 2000. You know, Susie, truly an amazing career. I tried to track down the number of magazine covers you were on prior to 2012 and couldn't find a number. Do you have any idea? I don't. You know, it's because of, you know, my career ended, oh gosh, almost 11 years ago, but it seems like it was so long, long ago. And I I never really, even while I was in my career, kept track of all the magazines or the articles. I I don't think my brain just wanted, it didn't even want to go there. It didn't want to focus on that. And I think listeners who aren't familiar with your story might understand that as we move through this interview. So, In order to paint the story of redemption or resilience that we like to tell in this podcast, there has to be a fall. So let's paint that picture for our listeners, and let's start with your brother, Dan. Tell us about Dan and what happened in 1999. It was um, 9-9 of 99. Uh, You know, the date, there is some some significance in his mind for that date, I do believe so. Um, he, at the time, we didn't know it, but he was already in a godlike state, and he was hearing voices. He had stopped taking his medication. He was diagnosed as bipolar since he was in high school, 
and at age 37, um, went off his meds, and I think he had been off for about two weeks. In my mind, when I when I last saw him two weeks before he ended up dying by a suicide, um, he was on fire. He was he seemed like the best he'd ever been doing in his entire life. He was um, biking 10 miles a day. He had just painted the entire house um, of his uh, wife and, and him. They had a house together. He just painted it. He was going a mile a minute doing all these things and just seemed so uh, full of energy. But yet on that day that I saw him, he wasn't really there. Even though he had this energy, there was something in his mind that was gone. It wasn't my brother anymore in looking back on him. It was somebody else. And I didn't know, nobody knew that he was showing signs of making amends with everybody before he was about to take his life. Um, He was giving things away. He was actually trying to give some of his money away. He, so he was showing these signs, but we didn't, nobody knew what these signs were at the time. And he did take his life um, on that day. And he actually jumped off of an eight-story building in a town called Wassa in Wisconsin. And that day changed my life, my family's life, um, everybody that he had touched forever. And um, that is pretty much when my story starts in that um, I couldn't deal with his death. I, I didn't deal with it at all. I just got back on the horse and kept training. I was going to train for my third Olympics. I actually left during the funeral. And um, after the funeral, they had a reception. And once the reception was done, I took off um, to go train and get treatment in Ireland. I was so focused on one thing, and that was winning a gold medal, which was going to be in 2000, a year later. And um, I just felt the world on my shoulders now to really win that gold because of my brother's death. I felt I I needed to somehow bring my family back together. Because as you know, and people with mental health issues or who have been also touched by suicide know that it's um, a devastating effect on the loved ones. And so I felt my family being torn apart. I read that prior to the 2000 Olympics, you were motivated by your brother's death, as you mentioned, a close friend who was dying of cancer, and for your husband, an attorney who had put his career on hold for you, that's a lot of pressure. How did you manage that prior to the Olympics? It was, you know, I was just so focused on one thing my entire life, ever since I was a little girl and um, I discovered I had this talent for running. My whole life was meant to be a runner, to be an Olympic runner, to eventually be the gold medalist. Everything in my brain focused only on that. I made so many sacrifices in my life just for that. I I ruined relationships. I hurt relationships in my family because I was so centered on just achieving this one goal. Um, So for me, when, when I did reach that pinnacle of 2000 in the Olympics and I'm on the starting line and I feel the pressure of the world on my shoulders, I feel that if I win, um, my family's going to be brought together, my husband for sacrificing his career to be with, with me and be my agent, my coach, my masseuse, it will be worth it for him. I, I wouldn't have ever let him down if I win the gold. And my sponsor has my sponsored Nike at the time invest, invested a ton of money in me, so I felt if I win for them, it will make everything that they've sacrificed for me, the commercials they've put me in, the advertisements, all the equipment and the time and patience they've had in me to win, I will make them happy. There was just so much. I felt the entire world, I felt you were watching me that day. Everybody who's listening to this was watching me that day. My brain was so out of perspective that this was the only thing happening. In your interview on ABC's 2020 last month, you described your thoughts right before the race when you were at the line. And personally, I could relate to you in that moment as you described it. Would you mind telling our listeners what was going through your mind at that exact moment? 
I felt like I was a deer in front of the headlights about to be hit by a car, and I couldn't move. I was stunned. I, I had trained my entire life to be at that starting line, and that was the last place I wanted to be at that moment. If I could have only had a broken leg and not have had to been there, that would have been the biggest relief. But I, I felt I had no out. I had no voice to speak up and say, I cannot handle this race today. I have, I am in way over, um, head over. I mean, I just can't handle where I am at this point. I can't take this pressure. And if I could have just vanished, I would have loved to have been able to vanish. But the TV cameras were on me. Everybody in the crowd I felt was chanting my name. It was just overwhelming. And um, I just wanted it to all be over. With the exception of being on an Olympic stage, I think a lot of our listeners can relate to your desire to want to just disappear at that moment. Yeah, I, I wanted to disappear. I wanted it just to be done. And when the gun went off, that was some bit of a relief because, okay, now we're progressing. We're going to get this over with, and I'm going to be done and I could vanish, hopefully. I just have to win this. But in the back of my mind, I knew I wasn't going to win the race. And I just took off like a wild animal because I was in a panic mode. And in the Olympics, you don't want to lead the race. It's just kind of well-known because races are tactical. You want to conserve your energy. But I was already having a panic attack. To speed up through the race with um, 200 meters to go in the race after almost four laps of running, I'm in the lead, and I'm starting to have a literal panic attack. I'm seeing white. My legs feel like cement blocks. I'm hyperventilating as I'm running. And a couple runners, I I can hear them behind me and feel them almost. And I know at that moment that I'm not going to win the race. So my panic attack increases and the anxiety is increasing. And it's basically panic attacks cripple your body. The worst thing to happen to a runner I somehow make it to um, another 100 meters, and with 100 meters to go, a girl passes me, and immediately the thought in my brain is, you're a failure. You just lost the gold medal. And then another girl passes me, and another girl passes me, and now there's no medal. And I'm, I'm thinking this. There's no medal. I just let the world down. I'm the worst failure ever. And at that split second, instead of just finishing the race, I told myself to fall, and I fell. I hit the surface of the track, and I remember my face laying on that surface and telling myself what an idiot I am and the worst person, and just get up and at least finish the race so you can say, okay, you you finished your third Olympic, made your third Olympic team, and you ran the whole race. It was humiliating, um, but at the at the same time, I legitimately was having an anxiety panic attack. So it was easy to pass out, per se, and um, I made it look so real. And that was the beginning of my dine, down spiral in my life was 15 years ago in uh, the Sydney Olympics. I had no idea that was the moment that would set off a bunch of chain reactions to pulling me down into my deepest, darkest moments. So at this point, you've had to deal with your brother dying by suicide, the struggles at the 2000 Olympics. Then after your daughter was born, I read you had some challenges with postpartum. Is that correct? I did. And um, after her birth, the doctor, I told the doctor during one of the routine visits with my daughter that I just didn't feel good. And she said, it's totally normal. Most women go through this period where, you know, it's a short period where they don't feel good. You're not sleeping right. It's a low postpartum. You know, it's totally normal. And that's all that was said. And I knew, I'm like, I almost heard her but didn't hear her because I knew this isn't right. Something's not right with me. And you're just kind of blowing it off. So I didn't want to challenge her. I'm just like, yeah, she's probably right even though I know this is something I've never experienced before. Uh, Maybe it will go away. But it didn't go away, and it got worse to the point of me starting to have suicidal thoughts and the thoughts becoming more and more dominant where 
I'm starting to really think about how I can act on them. How how can I make this actually come true? And um, it just happened that it got to a point where I wanted to drive my car off the road one night after I was coming home from work. And the only reason I had ever spoken up about that incident was that night my husband and I got in an argument and I blurted it out. By the way, I almost tried to kill myself tonight. Almost as like to maybe make him be quiet and stop this argument with me, um, but also a cry for help at the same time. And uh, at that moment when I said, by the way, I almost tried to kill myself by driving myself off the road, he stopped and he didn't do the, oh, you're just being dramatic, Susie, or that's ridiculous. You know, he didn't say anything like that, which would have been terrible. He said, you know what? I'm going to get you help immediately. I want you, I'm going to call the doctor or you call the doctor. And that was one of the greatest things he, that's happened to me during that time because he acknowledged that something was wrong. He didn't dismiss it. And that's when I started to get help. You know, Susie, I can't stress the importance of that. I cannot tell you how many times folks have either reached out to me because they know I'm open about talking about these issues or uh, reached out to somebody else inside of, of my network and said that somebody in their life is struggling, mentioned they had suicidal thoughts, and the person didn't do anything about it because A, they don't really know what to do, uh, or B, they just blow it off. And what your husband did was a, uh, exactly what you need to do. And I think it's very important that people take that seriously when people hear those cries for help. Right, because here we are having an argument. So it could have been easy for him just to, you know, walk away um, because we're in this argument. But at that moment, he just stopped. And he's like, okay, whoa, this is a red light. This is not good. Mm -hmm. You don't just throw around things like I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about taking my life. You, right. you just don't throw that out there to cause more pain or to hurt them. This is real. Yep. People don't do that. So he recognized that. And um, I then went in to see the doctor immediately and uh, was prescribed an antidepressant, which was actually working quite well for me. Um, I stayed on it, but I didn't, I didn't like the, the side effects. I was gaining weight. I was sluggish. I just wasn't me, even though I was feeling good. Um, so being on that drug was a good thing, but the, the side of me that was an athlete didn't like feeling not in good shape, didn't like feeling sharp. So I decided to go off of it. And uh, with the help of doctors, they knew I went off of it. And um, pretty much everything came back quite quickly within going off. It was you know, I, I want to say it was a month or two months, everything started to rage back where I wasn't feeling good again. Um, I then went in to see another doctor. This was a doctor I had never seen before because I couldn't get into my regular doctor because she was three months uh, booked and I needed somebody then. And so I just saw this family practitioner who within 10 minutes prescribes another um, uh, drug to me, antidepressant. And this is the antidepressant that makes my world change completely. Um, and again, within 10 minutes, I'm giving this drug. Never any background on what my mental history is in my family. Do you have any relatives who have mental health issues? Has anybody died by suicide? The doctor never asked any of these questions. And in looking back, I wouldn't have spoken up and said, oh, by the way, my brother died by suicide. I didn't know to say these things. And I mm -hmm. think that's a big help for people listening. If you are going in, if something's wrong and you're going in to see a doctor and you think you may have depression, you may have anxiety, whatever it is, you need to speak up about any, about your history and your family because doctors don't always ask that question. And specifically the full picture, because if you leave something out, that could change the treatment plan that they put you on. So let's fast forward to the ramifications of those drugs. From December of 2011 till December of 2012, you worked as a Las Vegas escort under the name Kelly Lundy. 
Now, listeners can read all about the details of this period in your new New York Times bestseller called Fast Girl, and you're very open about this period of your life. Why is that? Well, I was, um, I was misdiagnosed, first of all, and the drug that I was given brought on a hypersexuality in me. It's a confusing time because my whole story of how does this housewife become an escort in Vegas, the simplest way to explain it was it was a six-month sexual exploration. It started off by my husband and I sitting down saying, you know, we're having our 20th wedding wedding, wedding anniversary. What do you want to do that's on our bucket list? And what would be exciting? What, what should we do that nobody will ever know about? And we came up with, let's jump out of an airplane. And I was like, why don't we do a threesome? We've talked about this. Why don't we just do it and nobody will ever know? And so we did the threesome. We jumped out of the airplane. Um, but when we had the threesome, something changed in me from that experience in that I got this high that I had never felt before. And obviously I got a high from jumping out of the airplane, but this was different and it changed me. And that was the trigger or the light bulb moment that would set off the chain of reactions to get me to become an escort in Vegas. So in our uh, pre-interview conversation today, we were talking about advocacy and, you know, where areas that are rewarding in av- advocacy. And you said that talking about the hypersexuality, you're getting a lot of good feedback from folks because they don't want to talk about it. Besides the obvious, what, why do you think that is? You know, it's society. It's the taboo. It's, um, you know, the stigma. There's so many things um, with regards to sex that... You know, with my story, all of a sudden, I became this escort. And, you know, I had people that turned their back on me that were too embarrassed because of my actions that didn't want to have anything to do with me. And sex was the coping mechanism. It could have been drugs. It could have been alcohol. And if I would have chose alcohol or drugs as the coping mechanism, these people wouldn't have left me in my life. Uh, but because it was sex, that taboo, they, it was, they wanted to leave me. They left me. They shut me out because I was an embarrassment. And it's the same thing, they, whatever those coping mechanisms are. It's just we don't talk about sex as the coping mechanism. And why not sex? You know, drugs make us feel good. Alcohol makes us feel good. Sex makes us feel good. But for some reason, that's, that's an awful route to go. Um, and, and in my view, I could have gone on drugs. Drugs could have been the number one coping mechanism. And I know I wouldn't be here today. Mm-hmm. I would have overdosed so quickly. Um, so I, I just feel like we need to speak up about this. We need to talk about it. Doctors need to bring up the hypersexuality. We need to speak up about um, what hypersexuality is. People don't even know what the signs are. Um, and we can help people. We can save relationships. We can save marriages. People can have healthy, wonderful lives. This shouldn't be something that you have to be ashamed of. So, Susie, what are the signs of hypersexuality in a nutshell? Well, for me, it was constantly having sex on my mind, constantly thinking about only having sex, and um, also uh, excessive masturbation where you just can't stop. Um, it's it's a, something that is numbing the mind, which actually with the excessive masturbation only makes it worse. And um, obviously, having wanting sex constantly and constantly, um, that then, because of my bipolar, brought on the risky behavior. I couldn't just have sex. I had to have sex at a new level, and I'd have to take it to another level. And where I'm going to be hurting myself, and I'm hurting the people around me, the relationships that I have around me. But I couldn't see that. And in that hypersexuality mode, you don't see any of that, what's going around. You, you see what's making you feel good and what you need to do to feel good. You're not trying to hurt anybody. 
It's just how can I make my brain feel good? Okay. I, that's what can save relationships if people understand with mental illness, you're not trying to hurt other people. Yep. That was never my intent ever. I tell you, along those lines, in the Smoking Gun article from 2012, you said, and, and I'm going to quote you here, I take full responsibility for my mistakes. I am not the victim. I'm not going that route. I, I am owning up to what I did. I would not blame anyone except myself. And I got to tell you, Susie, that, that's powerful ownership of the problem. How, how did you get to that place? That. There's, it's such a long, it's been such a long journey to get to that. I, and I said that right away because I knew what I was doing. Um, I took ownership of it. I didn't know at the time when I, that statement came out right away. I didn't know at the time that I was bipolar and I had been misdiagnosed. I didn't know any of that. But I did know the whole time that I was an escort. I knew what I was doing. I knew... Um, that possibly what I was doing was frowned upon on most of society, a lot of society, not most, but a lot. And I felt that I had to, I couldn't blame my drug either for this. I couldn't say, oh, Zoloff was the reason I became an escort in Vegas. But I do believe Zoloff was the trigger to get me to do the route to becoming an escort in Vegas. And I also have to say that my sexuality and my views have changed dramatically from this whole experience. And, um, you know, I, I saw the world in Vegas like a lot of people do when they see the movies and they perceive it a certain way. And I saw the escorting world that way. And when I happened to slip into this all by accident and all by wanting to live a crazy bucket, li- bucket list life, I saw that the escorting world wasn't what I thought it was. And I saw, oh my gosh, these are people that are professionals. This woman's a lawyer. Uh, this woman's a realtor and she flies in on the weekend and she's escorts and has a few clients. And I saw this different world that opened up my eyes to be... Um, more open to people and the what women want to do with their body they have every right to decide so I I really grew a lot as a person from this whole experience where before in my life I never would have had any views on this because I would never have any ideas about it it would only be what I saw on tv so it's it's really changed me in, in many ways and I may have gotten off your question because my there's so many things I try to get in, and my brain, being a bipolar brain, has a hard time focusing on, on one thing. It's it's always thinking, okay, got to get that in, got to get that in. <laughs> so, so at times I, my answers may be like, wait, what did you just say? We just asked something else. So, yeah. But that's just part of being bipolar. Yeah, you know, Susie, you're not the first person who struggles with bipolar that's been on the show. I understand how that goes. Um, and that's just great information for people who are struggling. And that's actually a great lead into this question. So I found a lot of information about your days as an escort in doing research for this interview, a lot about your very successful athletic career. Didn't find a whole lot about this recovery period where you've rebuilt your mind and your life. From 2012 to today, how have you done it? And what could other people learn from that experience? It's interesting because in the book, I did have a lot more about recovery, but the publishers had to, there were 500 pages in the book, so the publishers had to take a lot out. So most of the recovery was taken out, um, which is really, in my opinion, the best part of the story. Um, And they want to possibly do another book, we'll see. But um, the recovery is the hardest part of this whole entire journey. It's a part where if you don't have support and you don't have love and you don't have hope, it's an impossible journey to ever ever see happen. And I, I think for me in writing this story, there's so many people that are silently suffering that don't have that ability to reach out in the first place and even acknowledge that something's wrong and they don't have that support. I want them to read my book and know that I support them and 
hopefully there's things in my book that um, they can take out and realize, okay, I can get better. I can, I can fight this illness. I can, um, I may never get over my illness and with bipolar, you never get over it, but you can get stronger and you can get knowledgeable and you can get educated and you can educate the loved ones around you. So you have this team that helps you to become better. Um, with cancer, we have all these doctors that are helping us in different routes to get over our cancer. Um, with the organ of our brain, we, in having mental illness, we have lots of doctors helping us, but we also need the family around us to, to be there. Just like if somebody's diagnosed, they said, with cancer, and they bring you the casserole to your house because they know you can't cook. The same thing is with mental illness. People... We need people to be there for us just because you can't see it. We, we need that support just as much, sometimes even more. We need to be acknowledged that, yes, yeah, something is wrong and there is help. And I have to say my, my husband in all of my, with my mental illness, the key that he gave as a spouse and that other spouses can do to their loved ones that have mental illnesses they can focus on the disease rather than the behaviors because with bipolar there's so many risky behaviors that come from this illness so many bizarre behaviors that make no sense to the loved one if you can put those behind you and focus on the illness that's where you're going to help that person heal but if you keep focusing on the behaviors if my husband kept focusing every day you slept with this man. You slept with that man. I can't believe you did this with that man. If that's all he focused on every day, how am I ever supposed to get any better if that's all I'm having to deal with? Yet he put that all aside, and he's like, We're, I'm going to help you focus on this illness, and what do we do to make these triggers less in your life so you won't look for that as your coping mechanism? So what do we do? What, what can I do, Susie, to help you? And basically, one of the things he helped to change my environment, he got me out of the job that I was struggling with. We sought counseling for our marriage. All these issues, you know, being a new mother, um, all the responsibilities that were overwhelming me in my life, he focused on taking them away as much as he could. And that was huge. That was huge. Without a and doubt. Again, yeah. We don't all, not everybody has that type of person. But if you know these things are happening in your life that are so overwhelming, you have to make a change. Yep. That's right. You, yeah, you have to. So, Susie, do you have a routine, or as we like to call it, a, a protocol of things that you do today on a regular basis to help maintain your mental resilience and stability? As you know, routine is key. It is crucial in keeping your life stable. And for me, I get up, I work out first thing in the morning. Um, that just puts me on the right track the whole day if I get that workout in. Then I'm able to function whether I'm working on promoting my book or I'm working on my artwork or I'm working on different foundations, uh, charities, um, events that I'm working on. I'm able to focus harder on those and uh, be more level. But for me, without my um, exercise, I'm still a bit of a roller coaster. And obviously, I take my medications every day. But, you know, there is this thought in my mind later in life when I'm 80 or 90, will I be able to have that energy to work out every day because I know how powerful that part of the drug is for me. And I hope so. I really do. And you're also a certified yoga instructor now, correct? Is that part of yes. your workout? I found that yoga was incredibly healing. And um, I, I do stress it for people who have never tried just to open your mind and give it a shot and at least give it you know, a shot for two weeks. You can't understand yoga in one day. So um, it's a great healing way. A lot of people that are in yoga have gotten into yoga because of something that they've had to deal with in their life. And yoga has been something that was either suggested to them 
where they accidentally found and found such great healing from it. Yep. I, I do it myself. And if you had told me 10 years ago, I'd be doing yoga. Uh, there was no way I could conceptually see myself doing it. My wife trying to do it every week. That's awesome. That's awesome. And there's, there's these little apps that you can get on your phone that will, you can do meditation now for five minutes, just take five minutes of your day to do some meditation. It's, it really is fabulous. Yeah. What, what's your experience with meditation, Ben? Um, well, once I was put, once I was taken off the Zoloft, which for me being bipolar, it wasn't a good drug. Um, it, because it helped to bring on the hypersexuality. The medication I'm on now is Lamictal, and that's definitely the hypersexuality has been taken away um, because of that drug, no doubt. It's calmed me. Um, it's not perfect. There's so many days I just want to not be on it so I can be more manic, but that's not the healthy person because that's the person who's going to do the crazy destructive things. And um, I know I can't go back there. So I'm on Lamictal now. I, I have Xanax as my backup if um, there's some, you know, sudden anxious energy that's coming towards me and I don't know how to handle it. Um, I, do have, I do have the Xanax. I try not to take it, though. Um, and I also started taking Stratera a year ago for my ADHD. And I found with the bipolar, it's really also helped in that it's helped to mellow me in a way, in a very good way. So good. I don't know if other people have found that Stratera, the effects that they've noticed with their bipolar, if it's helped them or not. But for me, I, I definitely have seen a, a good effect with it. Good, good. Well, yeah. just because we we're running a little long here, I promised you 30 minutes. Why don't we wrap up with this question? For someone struggling with extreme worry, stress, or their mental health, it, it really takes a lot of courage to share your story, especially when you're on the other side. But, you know, Susie, for you, it's magnified due to your high profile. Why'd you do it? I think I had kind of mentioned it earlier about people that were silently suffering who couldn't reach out for help um, because of the stigma of losing a job or you know, losing a spouse. Um, I, I wanted to speak up to show people that there's hope, there's support, and every one of us deserves a fantastic life. We all deserve that, and we should have that. And I think by writing this story, I wanted to show people, okay, your, your life could be over. And many people thought my life was over once I was found out as being an escort in Vegas, that there's no way this woman will ever get her life back. She's ruined. She's, she's ruined her life and her family's life forever. I wanted to show people that no matter what, you can fight back, and you never let other voices tell you how to feel. Where society was at times trying to tell me that I was the worst person in the world, and I... I came to my senses to understand that nobody has any right in this world to ever tell me how to feel, and nobody has any right to tell me that I should kill myself like my brother did, which people actually told me this in emails. They said I should just kill myself because that's how awful, awful of a person I am. So when having all this happen to me, it made me so much stronger and made me want to prove to myself and to everybody that you can be an even stronger and better person through these darkest, deepest, darkest times that we have in our life. So hopefully that will explain why I wrote the book. Susie, you really are an inspiration for people who are struggling with their mental health. I appreciate you coming on the show. Listeners, please pick up a copy of her new book, Fast Girl, and Susie, when you write that second book about your recovery, please come on the podcast and tell our listeners about it. Well, thank you. And I, I think that recovery book has so much to do with my husband and my daughter and just their belief in me getting better. Mm -hmm. And so, so I know they are a huge part of that book. But right. thank you. Well, thanks again, Susie. Thank you so much. 
This episode is sponsored by Conquerwari.org. Please visit Conquerwari.org and join our growing community.